Uh, welcome everyone uh, for this uh, event uh, that we are organizing uh, for the 10th anniversary of the discovery of the Higgs boson at CERN. Uh, we have a number of guests and uh, we will have two sessions um, uh, in today's uh, program. The first session uh, will be in English and in the second part uh, we will do in Turkish. After the first session we are going to give a... Uh, maybe like a 20 minute, 20, 30 minute break where uh, you can have uh, tea and coffee and in the second part um, we'll, we'll discuss in Turkish. Um, our uh, guest of honor uh, uh, for the first uh, uh, part is uh, uh, Professor uh, Rolf Dieter Hoyer uh, who, um, who uh, has um, been a, an instrumental physicist in uh, realizing this whole uh, Higgs uh, journey. Uh, he, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, he did his PhD at Heidelberg University um, uh, with uh, Jay Dixman, which one? Um, uh, Daisy Heidelberg. Daisy, yes. <laughs> and um, um, he was a full professor at University of Hamburg. And uh, between 2009 and uh, 2015, end of 2015, he was the director general of CERN. This was the time when the uh, well, Higgs boson discovery uh, was uh, made and announced to the world. Uh, after that, uh, he was the head of the uh, German Physical Society. Um, and um, he is also uh, the uh, president of the Sesame Council uh, uh, for the past um, uh, how many years? Four years. Um, um, uh, there is uh, well, uh, if you if you would like to, I I'm, I'm not good in uh, these sort of introductions. I had done a much better job when I was doing this at Boazici many years ago, uh, but I I'm somewhat unprepared for this time. I apologize to him as well. Uh, if you are uh, interested, I really uh, encourage you to have a look at uh, his Wikipedia page in 15 different languages. Um, so um, a very distinguished uh, scientist and um, um, also administrator. We are very honored to, to have you. Um, we will start with a, a short talk by him. Then we will uh, have uh, some questions in English and then uh, we'll do the break. So the floor is yours. Okay. First of all, many thanks for this introduction. Many thanks for hosting me here for a short time, but okay, it's short, it has to be short. Um, I'm, but I'm very eager to come back at some stage. No? Yeah? You count on that? Yes. Um, has anybody of you watched the uh, video of this morning's session at CERN? No? Then it's everything new, new what I tell you. Okay, I gave the introductory talk this morning to, to, the CERN, to the people at CERN and, and outside. And uh, now I give the same talk again. Ten years ago, I think we have it. I said this to the audience in a fully packed auditorium at CERN. And I said it not only to them, but also to the many followers worldwide. Ten years ago, on the morning of the 4th of July 2012, there were admirably careful scientific presentations from the spokespersons of CMS and ATLAS, Joe Candela and Fabiola Gianotti, on the observation of a new particle. Although we were only calling it Higgs-like, there was never really any doubt that after 50 years, 5-0, the wait for its discovery was finally over. I knew we had it. 50 years is a long time, but I can tell you um, that also seven days quarantine in a hotel room can also be rather long. So I just escaped now. So let's go back to the, uh, to the start of the journey, back into the 60s. The proud Angler Higgs, these are three theorists, the proud Angler Higgs mechanism and its associated scalar boson had been a constant presence in my and many other professionals' life as far as I can remember. 
when Robert Braun, together with François Anglais, and independently, only a few days later, Peter Hicks published their papers, which were soon followed by another paper from Goralde Kagan and, uh, and Kibbel. I was even not yet dreaming of becoming a physicist. Okay. It took a while, a whole decade, for the theoretical framework of electroweak physics to evolve and for the standard model to mature and for this proud Anglia Higgs mechanism to possibly become a part of it. At that moment, searching for the Higgs boson became now a priority. And the first milestone of the journey to success was achieved at LEP. LEP played a central part again in my career and in that of many experimental physicists of my generation, and I must say, meanwhile, also of younger generations. LEP, as well as the SLD detector at Stanford Linear Collider, was built to put the standard model of particle physics to a rigorous test through precision studies of, of uh, the gauge boson of the weak uh, interaction, the W and Z. And of course, in parallel, to look for the messenger of this broad Angler Higgs mechanism for the Higgs. It began operation in 1989. Ten years later, by the turn of the century, the job was done. Well, not quite. The job was nearly done. A plethora of precision measurements of parameters of the electroweak interaction had put the standard model on solid experimental ground, but the Higgs boson still escaped its detection. It didn't want to be found. However, the results from lab and SLD helped to put limits on the possible mass range. The living span, the mass living span of the Higgs got smaller and smaller. And surprisingly, the analysis showed that the Higgs boson could have a relatively low mass, which might even have been in the reach of lab. In fact, the most likely place to look for the Higgs boson was just above the energy range that had already been explored. Seems to me a general feature of, of particle accelerators. The new thing is just above where you can go. Well, I was asking myself, was it bad luck or was it luck? I leave it to you to decide. The community, of course, continued to look for the boson, but the focus of the search moved to the other side of the Atlantic, to Fermilab, where the Tevatron Collider began its, its second operating period in 2001 and further constrained the mass range available for this Higgs boson. With, as we know now, a mass of 125 GeV, the Higgs boson is surprisingly light, but it was nevertheless out of reach of both LEP and Tevatron. An important point is that during these decades of intense fundamental research in particle physics, technologies evolved. And they eventually enabled the construction of a sufficiently powerful machine. It took rather long, again, decades, but it is, to my mind, a prime example how science works. You have advances, advances in fundamental science. They give rise to the next generation's innovations, which in turn provide advanced tools for future re fundamental research. It's a virtuous circle, and it's at the core of human advancement. And the very important message is, this circle needs to remain unbroken and supported in a sustained way. The LHC is the world's largest superconducting installation, which, in a peculiar, in an interesting way, brings the Higgs boson's ex experimental discovery back to its theoretical origins. The reason for this statement is, that the theory which demands the Higgs boson is derived from the theory of superconductivity. So the two belong, so to speak, together. And it, I find it fascinating that the Higgs is then detected at a superconducting machine. 
Let's now zoom into 2010-2011. There was a great deal of expectation and excitement when the LHC started and the experiments began first remeasuring known uh, standard model processes. You have to understand these also at this machine. And then moved on to search for new physics. At that time, many expected that supersymmetry would be the LHC's first major discovery. The theory was so compelling, at least to me as a naive uh, experimental physicist, and much of the parameter space predicted for supersymmetry would be accessible with the LHC. However, we were betting on the wrong horse. A year later, 2011, 20, 2011, 2012, the excitement grew with statistics. And already at the European Physical Society meeting 2011 in Grenoble, there were tantalizing hints, fluctuations, that there could be something new. But there were too many of these fluctuations. I can tell you at the press conference, journalists became impatient, but I told them how to learn to become patient. And they, they got it. It was not long then, however, before ATLAS and CMS began to see something new at the same mass window. It's, of course, important. It was around 125 GeV in the two-photon mass spectra. I must say, as Director General, I was in a very privileged position as I got to see the analysis from both experiments, which were otherwise carefully guarded secrets in order to avoid any possible bias. You, otherwise, you, you need two independent ones. As the statistics slowly accumulated, I could see that both experiments seemed to be detecting the same thing. As the 4th of July approached, I was very, very pleased that their individual analysis enabled them each to present results at the level of a discovery on July 4th. Okay, what should I say? It was an overwhelming time for us, but it must have been an even greater time for a young researcher in particle physics. I could judge this from the mood at CERN. It was exciting, vibrant, and I'm sure no one present will ever forget these days. It is not given to all of us to witness a discovery of this magnitude. And I can tell you, when I came in the laboratory in the morning, um, I never have seen that beforehand. We had locked the, the auditorium because we didn't want to have people enter, entering there. There was a queue, very, very long, incredibly long. People were sleeping in front of the doors in order to get a place, a seat in the auditorium. And many knew that I would not get a seat. But the mood was independent of that. Everybody was, okay, hoping, okay. Anyhow, for me, the discovery of the Higgs boson was undoubtedly one of the greatest highlights of my career. Now let me take this occasion to stress that this research, this discovery, was and is a global effort. It would not have been possible without international collaboration. And that over half a century. And it shows what mankind can achieve when it works constructively together. There was huge excitement in our community. That's not unexpected. But what about outside the community? Well, the excitement was not at all con confined to particle physics. The general public was, I could, I could say, extremely interested. Now why? What's so special about this particle, about this type of research? Well, I assume because it is play, uh, placed at the origins of our be being, it describes how the universe started and evolved, but not why, which is a question we are very often asked. It fascinates people, it intrigues people, it is placed at the interface of knowledge, 
and the journalist Jeffrey Kruger from Time magazine captured the moment of the discovery, to my mind, perfectly. I quote, Despite our fleeting attention span, we stopped for a moment to contemplate something far, far bigger than ourselves. And when that happened, faith and physics, which don't often shake hands, shared an embrace. I like this. But is there really a fleeting attendance span? Yes, most of the time. But I think not in this case. Even a decade after its discovery, many in the public know, talk and ask about the Higgs boson. It's very often this is the case. And today, scientific journals issue special editions, special collections or articles on the discovery. When I asked them why, the answer was along the line, the Higgs discovery was extra special. Okay, as we celebrate today the 10-year anniversary of this discovery, the LHC is about to embark on its third operating period, higher collision energy, opening up potential new windows for, for discovery. It's, I'm excited by these prospects and by those of the higher luminosity LHC, which comes in the next uh, 10 years. The journey continues, albeit with a different objective. Let me at the end quote Peter Hicks. We have scratched the surface, but we have clearly much more to discover. And I am sure you and many people are outside, young or not so young, will soon be able to say, we think we have something. Thank you. Thank you very much for this talk. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to start by asking some uh, somewhat personal questions, not related to physics. We are going to cover that a lot, hopefully, during the second session. But since we have, uh, we have you here, um, I think, um, well, some of the excitement that you mentioned during your talk uh, deserves uh, a number of uh, uh, well, personal questions, if you don't mind. Um, I'll, I'd like to start by asking, how does it feel uh, to be maybe the first person to see that this uh, particle came to be? I mean, you see, we discover a particle only once in human history, right? We discovered the Such electron one time, or yeah. the, we discover, I mean, this is a fundamental particle, and no one is going to discover the Higgs boson a second time, right? And out of this whole human history, uh, you happen to be at a position where you actually see the data coming from the two experiments at the same time. What sort of feeling is that? A good one. <laughs> it, was, it was a good one over, I would say, one year. Because it started, of course, with low statistics. When you have low statistics, you have a lot of fluctuations. But you could already see there were quite a few fluctuations, of course. And there were some positions in the mass spectra where both experiments saw something. So that already started my excitement. Of course, I was not, I could not show it because otherwise people outside would have known that. But it continued like this and uh, it, uh, how to say, it was overwhelming, really, all the time. And only when I was sitting in the airplane to Melbourne where the conference happened a, a day later, I started realizing what had happened. Some of you are so deep in the whole thing that you, the realization comes only after the, the stress is over. But I feel pretty good, I must say. And, 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 but, but then how do you keep such a thing secret? I mean, didn't you tell your wife or someone, <laughs> just like uh, you have this data that's coming from the two experiments, you see that there is a match in a certain region and you're not supposed to tell anybody or, well, at least no physicist, right, uh, to, to not bias. Uh, you don't say anything and your face becomes maybe a bit worse than normal or whatever, or usual or so. Uh, no, but... I'm sure the people, the scientists in, in the experiments, they saw their own data. 
I mean, after they are unblinding. And they knew they have something and they were hoping, of course, that the others yeah. had something. Mm -hmm. So one has just to shut up. Yeah, well, we, we, we got really excited. We were always wondering what our CMS colleagues were seeing. Yeah, yeah, but you yeah. were seeing those. I so was seeing that, yes. That's uh, quite amazing. And, um, yeah, because if, if you detect something at CERN, the CERN management has to give an agreement that one uh, presents it. And uh, that was, by the way, also some discussion, if we find something, how to present it. At Melbourne at the conference or at CERN? Now, most of our fund, fund comes from Europe. Mm -hmm. So we said, okay, we owe it to our European sponsors that we do it in Europe. Okay. But we agreed with Melbourne that it's, it was the opening talk, talks for the, for the conference. That was an amazing time, I guess. Sorry? Amazing time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's incredible. It's 10 years ago. I can't, I can't believe it. But uh, now let me just take uh, one step <coughs> back. Uh, when you became the director general, you are now responsible for an essentially 8 billion euro project, right? Just the LHC is 8 billion euros, uh, if I remember correctly. Well, I think it's six, but it well, doesn't it, Well, the, the US accounting or yeah, okay. yeah, something like that. Yeah. So how does that feel? I mean, uh, if something goes bad, you are responsible for that to some extent. How, how does that work? I didn't feel the pressure. But you see, I came in a sort of fortunate situation. Because when I was elected, the LHC was starting. When I took office, the LHC was broken. So we had then the chance to repair it. And we got free hand from our uh, uh, delegations to do it in the way we think would be the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. The only thing they didn't want to, they gave us enough time, but the only thing they didn't want us to do to have the same problem again. Mm -hmm. Of course, you, should, you cannot make, I mean, this is a huge machine, a huge prototype that something happens that's uh, quite normal, but it should never happen a second time. But because they gave us free hand, we did it faster than I promised. Wow, and it worked like yeah. nicely. Yeah. And uh, well, what do you think will be the next big, uh, the future surgical collider? Or um, I know this is a, a touchy subject, but would you like to comment on what? Uh, well, not necessarily. If well, feel free to to comment the way you prefer. Well, I, I usually don't comment on uh, future plans of uh, other managements. On the other hand, I think one thing is clear. Um, CERN is a fantastic laboratory. CERN knows how to do big projects. CERN knows how to do international collaboration. So whatever new large accelerator, be it circular or be it linear, linear to my mind, would best be placed at CERN. Because all other places in the world have first to learn how to do international things. It's not so easy. And the environment in Geneva is very open. But I don't want to make a comment on circular versus linear. linear. Okay. It's also a question, it's like a question of this. Fine. Um, well, I've asked my share of interesting questions. So let me first ask um, if uh, well, I have a question that yeah. is still along the lines of your question. What do you think will be the uh, discovery that will be just beyond the reach of LHC? I only had hand luggage, cabin luggage, <laughs> so I couldn't take my crystal ball with me. That's a, that's a problem. Um, well, in a more neutral way, in a more open way, the next discovery will be an indirect one, to my mind. With an indirect discovery, I mean one finds that somewhere the predictions of the standard model do not agree with the experiment. But then, once it does not agree with the experiment, or the experiment does not agree with the, with the standard model, then you know, in principle, where to look. At the moment, we don't really know where to look. In history of particle physics, it was like this. We had uh, the prediction of the Z boson, at the mass even through indirect measurements. We had the top through indirect measurements. 
we knew that there must be a Higgs or something similar through indirect measurements. So to my mind, the next step must be to find somewhere a scratch in this standard model. Where? I don't know. When? In a few years. I hope. Yes. Uh, thank you for being here, first of all. I think it was a surprise for me and maybe Altoja. Uh, we didn't know that you were around and I think that made this 10th anniversary even as a special event for us. So I don't think that uh, anybody in the world as a physicist have a chance to celebrate this with someone like you. So I think we are definitely in a, a historic moment. Uh, I feel that way. and. Um, I'm also, uh, I mean, uh, feel like since uh, Arjan Ocha really made this very uh, good comments about uh, your position as a, you know, director general when the Higgs was uh, discovered, uh, I think uh, you should definitely think about writing a book about those times. I, I, I think I would definitely get one copy. <laughs> uh, so uh, but you have to pay for it. Yeah, well, I do that. <laughs> Even though it's quite expensive nowadays, but uh, <laughs> books. Uh, so uh, you should definitely put some uh, those historical times. Is a you know? I'm a bad writer, hmm. but I have a good ghost writer. So. Oh, that's good. <laughs> uh, one other thing that keep me bugging for the last nine years, I would say after the announcement of uh, the Nobel Prize, uh, one year, pretty much one year after the discovery. I think once uh, the Higgs was discovered, I think it was clear that a Nobel Prize was somehow or they're given uh, for that uh, uh, discovery, but it wasn't clear how it was going to happen. So, uh, and there were speculations, I think. Uh, and it turns out that uh, CERN uh, didn't, didn't get any credit. I think if there was one, uh, part of the prize given to CERN, it would be probably the one that you would get, right? You would get the one. Uh, so I still don't know why that didn't happen. I mean, uh, why CERN didn't get any... Uh, there is a clear rule in the Nobel Prize Committee to give the Nobel Prize to maximum three individuals, mm -hmm. still living, of course. Yes. Um, I think everybody supported the, the fact that CERN would be the right thing to give it mm -hmm. also to CERN as a, as a sort of inci the responsible institution mm -hmm. to have carried out the, the, uh, the experiments. But I think it would have been a mistake, a big mistake. If you change the rules because you have an op the occasion to do something else, that's always a problem. If, if you want to change the rules, you should do it when there is not a candidate in front of the door. So I think it was even better that CERN didn't get the Nobel Prize because everybody would have said, this is, they have changed the rules because of CERN. We tried afterwards to trigger them to change the rules, but they, they didn't want to yet. But uh, Higgs and... Uh Angular shared, right? Like yeah. uh, there's uh, still one spot, right? I mean, since there they was can't... a third place. Yes, third, yeah. there's a third. There was a third place, but uh, but CERN is not an individual. I thought, like uh, you know, for example, when the neutrino oscillations, for example, about the Nobel Prize for the neutrino oscillations, they gave it to the director of the labs, right? So I thought, like, it could. But the director of the lab at that time was strongly involved in the in the measurements, as mm -hmm. far as I know. Now here, again, we are in a complicated situation because it was a much more international effort mm -hmm. than with the neutrino oscillations. Mm -hmm. It was also not clear, would you give it to uh, ATLAS or to CMS? Why to the Director General who is in place at that moment and mm -hmm. not the Director General when there was the decision to do the LHC, I, I think I think it was it was a wise decision, and uh, my statement at that time was exactly as now. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people might have been disappointed, mm -hmm. but I think I still think it was the right 
the right attitude, the right decision. I mean, considering the fact that like it took 50 years to find it, so I think it deserves something, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, but maybe. we got the prize of uh, Asturias, which is uh, the sort of Spanish Nobel Prize uh, given by the prince or princess of Asturias. We got it together. Uh, Anglea Higgs and I was then the representative of, mm -hmm. of CERN, yeah. yes. But um, to bend rules in some way for a special case, I would have felt a little bit awkward. Yes. But everybody remembers CERN was impossible. And in the quote, mm -hmm. there's also CERN mentioned. Yes, actually, uh, I was hoping that they would split to the collaborations. And that would give me uh, something like uh, $50 or something, the <laughs> Nobel, Nobel Prize <laughs> to, for my share, but then it didn't materialize. Yeah, I would yeah. just put this on the wall, this is like $50 from the <laughs> Nobel Prize. Yeah. But, uh, I think it's better to be remembered in the normal way and not mm -hmm. by a special way. Okay. Um, well, maybe we can take now a couple of questions from the audience, um, if, if you don't mind, of course. Um, so I see <clears throat> Professor Bostosun. Thank you very much. It is an honor to uh, host you here. I mean, this doesn't count to half an hour, okay? We are going to have uh, uh, exchange of views. Now, I am wondering, I mean, um, uh, what was your plan B? if it's, it's not worked out during... Yeah, first, you have to tell me what would not have worked out. What? Sorry, what? what? The okay. LHC or the discovery? Discovery, yeah. On the discovery, there was not a plan B. There was just always the explanation to, this, to the public and to the journalists that we were sure to make a discovery. I stuck my neck out to say, we are sure we make a discovery. However, we did not specify the discovery. It could have been the Higgs, or it could have been something else which acts like the Higgs. So we were sure that the origin of electroweak symmetry breaking for the, for the people who are in the field would be during the running time of LHC. So that was our, our line. And uh, the problem, of course, in this case is the Higgs particle is rather easy to explain. This something else would have been very much more complicated and later. And then you have to explain why it takes now even more time. So I was happy that the Higgs was there. But a, a real plan B, no, that was a strategy from the very beginning. And I tell you, at least officially and semi-officially, I never have a plan B. Because if you have a plan B, you end up with a plan B. You have to be very careful. <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> okay, that's the third one today. I'd like to add if, a small thing, if you don't mind. Uh, there were a number of us who were working on Higgsless models. Mm -hmm. uh, I was one of them, actually. Um, I am always like on the uh, safe side uh, of these things. And uh, we were sure that something would be discovered. Yeah. So um, we, were, we were, if you like, there is not a plan B, but there was a plan A.5 where yeah. we were looking for uh, Higgsless models. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No. That's another lesson. Research has to be completely open. If you do only research towards one theoretical model, you are not unbiased. You have to be very open. And that shows the openness. It doesn't look only for the Higgs. Maybe uh, I can make a comment on this point about this question. In fact, uh, there were papers written before the Higgs discovery, uh, some theoreticians and people working on phenomenology calling nightmare scenario. In fact, the scenario was about the fact that only Higgs is discovered and nothing else uh, is going to found. So, in fact, uh, we are realizing pretty much that scenario so far, right? I mean, uh, so people were so sure about the discovery somehow, uh, most of the people, I would say. 
but uh, most of uh, the expectations are more discoveries other than Higgs, I mean, some supersymmetry, yeah. extra dimensions. So, uh, so I think, I mean, plan B might be talked about for cases, what happens if there's nothing else other than Higgs, which is in fact what is happening nowadays, so. But this is a plan B for the theorists, yes. not for the experimentalists. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Um, That's I, true. I, yes, it's a difficult situation, but we know that the standard model, as the name says, is a model. It describes, to my, to my surprise, in a very elegant way, in a very com way which I understand, um, the microcosm in an energy region which we, which we can reach. But we know that it, there is a lot of questions open beyond that energy range. So there must be something more. There must be another model around which contains the standard model. It's up to you theorists now to tell us which are, what is the other model. Um, so I'm, I'm confident that there is something. This is why I think it is absolutely vital to, to look for these scratches which Peter Hicks was mentioning. Um, that's plan A and plan B at the same time. I know your time is rather limited, so um, I would like to see if I can get one last question from the audience and uh, maybe we can uh, just continue in the uh, One last question, is there anyone? Yes. Hello, it's an honor to meet you. Uh, I want some uh, asking a question unrelated to Higgs boson. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, if I ask, uh, personal question. Asking you can. <laughs> if you get uh, a response, we see. How did you choose to become a scientist and what was your inspirations during this way? And uh, <clears throat> The teacher. <laughs> yeah. It was a teacher. It was your teacher. It was a teacher. So, yeah. uh, you know, the uh, science world, you fail a lot. Uh, so, what was the power that keep you moving? I just want to ask it. Well, it's a extremely interesting field. From the very beginning in school also, I was always interested in the smallest. And then I re realized that the smallest and the largest are connected. That took me some time, no, not yet at a, as a pupil. And what I liked very much with my teacher was that he didn't ask any formula. And I'm bad on learning things by heart. He asked for the logic, for the understanding behind formulas. He didn't care about numbers, uh, uh, pi pi or two or whatever. Just the question of understanding. And he once said to me, Hoyer, if you don't study physics, you make a mistake. So I wanted not to make a mistake for him. And then uh, I had very good uh, role models, models in, my, in my PhD uh, supervisor and uh, the spokesperson of the experiment, so it went smooth. Can I have um, a comment or ask, I mean, again, similar, uh, not related to the Higgs, but there has been a long-standing uh, discussions about Turkey-Sun relations and memberships. I mean, um, I would like to ask your frank opinion about a country like Turkey who has not yet completed the infrastructure in terms of uh, accelerator, accelerator research, you know, in terms of that, uh, and CERN membership. Um, can you, can I get your frank opinion about this? And also, how uh, we could benefit the most out of this uh, associate member? Uh, that would be great because, I mean, this has been a long, long discussions and there are different groups and, you know, sometimes very hard questions. Therefore, this is out of Higgs, but I will be very happy to get your opinion. Thank you. There are always different camps. I, I agree. Don't forget you are associate member and you, you, you became associate member when I was director general. Um, because I enlarged uh, CERN because I thought we need more members or associate members. 
in order also to help countries which don't have an infrastructure, a full infrastructure yet, to work at CERN, because CERN is a common infrastructure, it belongs to the stakeholders. The stakeholders are the members and the associate members. And what can it help you? It can attract young people who see the carrot of CERN, where they can go to learn, to do some experiments, to get internationally connected. And for you, in-house, to get highly ed educated people, especially in international connections back. And then you might have uh, interactions, collaborations with CERN, for example, in the accelerator section, in order to move up what you need in accelerator uh, knowledge, etc. So the real advice I want to give you is don't only send people to CERN, also get the knowledge of CERN back into and trigger your industry to do something. And I think uh, you can, the, the industry can. But that means you need to have somebody between CERN and the country who knows both sides in order to find the right industrial uh, areas where you can contribute. What is? How but Turkey performs. Maybe I can give that answer. I, I just wanted to say I cannot give that answer because <laughs> I'm out since many years. The, the, the industrial return of Turkey is actually quite good. Um, we went over um, the, the, the well, actual return level. We went over that uh, within our third year. Ah. Uh, the last two years with COVID, we are uh, getting back 80%. Uh, but um, uh, just this year, we have four uh, new contracts we in, in line. If we get any of them, we will be again uh, quite a bit higher than 100%. So Turkish industry is actually quite, uh, quite good. Good. Uh, yeah. We are, we are proud of our country in this regard. Um, are, but that means you have a good contact person. Yes, we also okay. do have a very excellent uh, liaison officer who is just putting yeah. our industry in line. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I think we have run out of time, um, but um, maybe we can ask, you can ask the questions one, once we go out um, right. to have. Or he, he, he's sitting there and he's, he's very young, so give the youngster okay. a chance. Okay, a short question then. I don't know if it's related with your uh, considering that, comparing that is, is a good manners, or I don't know, but I really wondered that which is the most important for the science history, the picturing of a black hole or the Higgs discovery? The Higgs discovery. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> No, I think both are extremely important and both really give a good crown to the theorist. I mean, it took the hundred years until Einstein's uh, gravitational waves uh, were, were measurable. The point is both give not only food for the theorists, but also food for the experimentalists because you you open a new field of, of research, for example, with the, with, the, with the gravitational waves. And in the Higgs case, you have to study that particle until you find its scratch. So it's, it's new, uh, new areas of research, sort of, new, new directions of research. I like both uh, um, results. And the main thing is that both results, again, fascinate people and hopefully bring more young people into science. Where they go afterwards, it doesn't matter, but they have smelled what science is. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Rolf uh, for this. Uh, uh, well, it was a privilege to have you here at Nuken. Um, I would like to now uh, give uh, this uh, break if, and uh, we will continue in, I don't know, some 20 minutes or so. 
uh, for the second session where we will discuss uh, this time in Turkish all these uh, well, the nice discovery of uh, the Higgs. Uh, thank you for coming and. Uh,